Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, do keep that. Uh, do keep your Bibles open. I'll have some of the bits on the screen as we go through, but I mean, if you can see it all together uh, in the Bibles in front of you, that'd be absolutely brilliant. But let's um, pray before I speak. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you promised that it is uh, powerful, living and active. Please speak to us today as we look at it together. Amen. Now, uh, as, uh, as Ben said, my name's Nathan. I'm a member of this congregation and we're going to be looking at Genesis 16 together this morning. But first up, let's have, I just want to take you with me on a journey. And it's a journey out into the ocean. And you and me, foolishly maybe, have decided to sail across the Pacific Ocean. When I say you, I don't mean all of you at once. Just imagine it's me and you, whoever you are. Um, And we are sailing across the Pacific Ocean and suddenly there is a storm. And it is a massive storm and there are waves and there is wind and the boat is in a lot of trouble. And we are clinging to the boat when it capsizes. And we are in the water and we are clinging to the remains of our boat and eventually we wash up on a desert island and we are on the desert island together and we make some we make as best camp as we can and we're living on the island together but after a while we're realizing this isn't going to work and so we decide we, we will build a raft from what we have left of our boat and one of us will have to set off for land in hope of finding help. So we have a discussion and obviously I go on the boat. Uh, it's, the, you know, it's only big enough for one and I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I set off into the distance. But before I go, I say these words to you. I say these words. I say, I promise I will come back for you. I promise I will come back for you. And off I go. And you now are alone on the desert island. And it's been a while, and I haven't come back. How do you feel? What are your worries? Maybe you think, oh, he's been lost at sea. Maybe you think it it was impossible all along. How could he promise that? Maybe you just don't trust me to come back. Maybe I don't care enough for you. Maybe I've forgotten. I've made it to land, and it's too exciting to be on land now. Who cares about whoever that was back on that island? It's worrying, isn't it, waiting on a promise. And um, we've been looking together at Genesis. Uh, Genesis 15, over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at it for two weeks on the trot, and we've been looking at God's promises. Uh, God's covenant to Abraham, or Abram, as it was then, uh, in chapter 15, to give him a land and a people, a people so great that he will have more offspring than the number of stars in the sky. That is a huge promise. And it's a great high point in the Bible, in the Bible story. It's up and down, but this is a great high point. And it's a story that tells us of our creator God and his relationship with us, his creation. And in his incredible grace, he offered that incredible promise of blessing to one man, Abraham, who did nothing but believe in the incredible promise. For the future. He believed God and he was seen as righteous by God because of that. But now we reach chapter 16 and did you see in verse 3 of the bit that we just read, they have now been living in Canaan for 10 years. 10 years and they still have no children. No children. And Abraham and Sarai are getting a little bit twitchy because it's been a long time they think. They're not getting any younger they think. Maybe God isn't going to follow through on his promise. Maybe we can't trust in him this. Surely it is impossible now. God can't bring us a child. We've been waiting such a long time. When will it happen? Will it happen at all? And Sarai is fed up. She is fed up and she blames God and she says, the Lord has kept me from having children. And so she thinks she might have a good idea. She thinks she might have a good idea. So let's read this. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. 
Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So maybe Sarai's thoughts sound a little bit like this. Well, it's been too long now. I'm too old, and if the Lord isn't going to build this family, I'm just going to have to do something about it myself as if somehow the Lord isn't competent, as if somehow she needs to fill in the gap. And so she does do something about it. She comes up with a plan. And to be fair to Sarai, she isn't coming up with some kind of ludicrously ingenious original plan to have Hagar sleep with her husband. Now, this is something that was done in the time, something that was quite commonplace in families where there have been no children. But I guess Sarai, Sarai thinks, well, everyone else is doing it. Why not us as well? God's promise wasn't specifically for me, was it? It wasn't for Sarah, it was for Abraham. So uh, why, why does it matter where the child comes from? God promised a child. Why, why can't I just help out a little bit? What is wrong with that, she thinks? And quite awfully, Abraham agrees to this. Now, Abraham is supposed to be this great man of faith, right? He is kind of pinnacle of man of faith in the, in the Old Testament. And he just, he just goes ahead and ignores God's word on marriage and sex. He completely abdicates his responsibility of leading his family. Literally, uh, in, in the passage, he obeys Sarai in this, and he flows right along with the culture of the time. So don't go, don't go looking at this and thinking, oh, well, it's all Sarai's fault. She's a scheming woman. No, this is mostly Abraham's fault, if we're honest. Uh, he really should have been leading on this. So it's his fault that they're in this mess. I wonder whether this interaction between Abraham and Sarai rings any bells to you. We've been working our way through Genesis, and um, we've seen this pattern before, haven't we? In Genesis 3, Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam, and Adam ate it. In this story, Sarai takes Hagar and gives her to Abram, and Abram sleeps with her. It is a complete mirroring uh, of that interaction. Sarai took Hagar, gave her to Abram, he slept with her. And Adam and Eve's problem, they don't trust God's promise. They don't trust God's promise that if they eat from the tree, they will surely die. They don't trust God's promise that he cares for them. Abraham and Sarai, they don't trust God's promise that, they, that God will build a great nation through Abraham. They don't trust him. And so, like Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarai act in their own interests outside of God's word. And what is the result? What is the result? It is mess. It is an absolute mess. Let's have a look at the passage. I'm not going to read it all out. Uh, but so we've got um, one to six, and I'll just read out some selected highlights. So let's just run through it. Sarai, in fact, we'll skip that. Just read it in your Bible. Sarai gives another woman to her husband. Then when she gets pre pregnant, blames her husband and mistreats the other woman so badly that she runs away from the desert. Abraham just goes along with it and sleeps with the other woman, then completely abdicates responsibility again when Sarai comes complaining and just lets Sarai abuse her. And then Hagar, you might think poor Hagar, but she sleeps with another man's wife, proudly rubs it in, his, in the wife's face when she gets pregnant and ends up pregnant in the desert. It is a mess, and it is a mess worthy of Jerry Springer. It is absolutely atrocious. But this is what happens. This is what happens when instead of trusting God's promises, we seek to gain God's blessings ourselves by shortcutting God's word. This is what happens. It's not how things are meant to be. And it's not like we're stuck on a desert island waiting for my improbable return from, from somewhere. No, this is God who's done the promising. God is absolutely competent at keeping his promises. He is powerful. He gave Abraham that sign. I've made all the stars in the sky, he says. God does not need us to do his work for him. He needs us to be faithful to him whilst he does the work. 
And sometimes he will then graciously do that work through us. And we might look at this playing out and think, oh wow, look at them, what a mess they made of that. God has given them this incredible promise directly and instead of trusting God, they gave up and instead followed the way of the world and thought they knew better. But waiting is hard, isn't it? Waiting is hard. Especially when you don't know how long you have to wait for. Especially when you're not particularly keen on the circumstances you have to wait in. And as Christians, we should know all about waiting. Kind of waiting is one of those things that characterizes the Christian life. Abraham and Sarai, they're waiting on the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And we are waiting on God's promises too to be fulfilled. Promises of Jesus' return. Promises of a new heaven and a new earth. Promises of prosperity. Promises of intimacy. Promises of rest. The promise that he will build his church, his people. And his promises are for us now. That he have been promised to us and have been fulfilled in Jesus. But they're not yet fully fully fulfilled. We have to wait for that and it can feel so very hard sometimes. We don't know when Jesus will return. We don't know when God will put everything right. And so we too might be tempted to start um, doubting God's word. Is God really in control? Will he really keep his promises? Does he really care about us? Will we really receive his blessing? His promises can seem so far off. Maybe we're struggling in life. We're trying so hard to be faithful. But maybe we start thinking that fulfillment of those promises and God's blessing might come along quicker. Maybe if we just take things into our own hands a little bit. Maybe it's the promise that God will build his church. Maybe it's that promise that his children will number more than all the stars in the sky, but maybe we just don't see it. Maybe it just don't see it happening or happening fast enough. And you look at the church and we think, we're so weak, we're so small. How can it possibly be true that he will build this people out of us? And maybe you start thinking, oh, well, maybe God's word isn't powerful enough. Or maybe it's not attractive enough. And so maybe we start being tempted to water it down or take some bits out. Try and make God's word more appealing. Because God's word doesn't fit into our culture, does it? No. So maybe we change it a little bit so that it does. Or maybe we start thinking that the church needs to be more slick. Good luck with that. Uh, Or we somehow, as God's people, are the ones who need to make God's promises happen. Don't fall into the same trap as Abraham and Sarah. Don't. God is the one who works. Our job is to be faithful to him and trust his word. Because when we use our power instead of his power, or when we trust the world's word instead of our word, what is the result? The result is mess. Maybe it's a bit more personal to you. Maybe you're waiting on intimacy the intimacy that we will have when we're in heaven with God, with each other, it will be perfect. But right now, maybe you desire that intimacy with a husband or a wife, and you've been waiting for God to act, but he hasn't, or at least not in the way that you would want. And you know that in heaven we won't be lacking for that intimacy, you know that, God's promised it, so it's hard waiting though, isn't it? Maybe you think, well, I'll move things on a bit now myself. You know, why don't I just start looking outside the church? Why don't I just start looking at people who aren't Christians? You know, maybe I'll be able to convince them afterwards that that the gospel's true. Maybe you move in with them. Maybe you start sleeping with them. Maybe you marry them. Maybe. But... The result of that, and I tell you, the result of that, and taking it into your own hands and trying to grasp God's promise for yourself, trying to grasp God's blessing, they are, the result will be mess. Or maybe you're already married and you've discovered that relationship in your marriage 
That isn't the thing that satisfies. And it isn't. It's not the same as the intimacy we will have with God in heaven. But maybe it's not enough though. And so you seek a little bit more. You seek that intimacy somewhere else. Maybe you seek it on the internet. Why not? Everyone else is doing it. Just reach out and grab that thing that offers satisfaction now. Don't. Because the result will be mess. The result will be mess. Or maybe you just don't see what God's plan is in your life. Maybe it is really hard for you. He's promised to prosper you. He's promised to give you a hope and a future, but life seems hard. You don't seem to be getting anywhere. Maybe instead you might seek to achieve, maybe through your career, gain enough money to enjoy the things of this world now. Maybe you can find recognition and praise there. Why shouldn't you try and get ahead? by any means necessary, rather than faithfully working for God at work? Why shouldn't you be pushing people down so that you can be noticed? But know this, that does not bring about God's blessings faster. It does not. It just brings mess. And we saw last week, uh, Ben was sat here, I was sat here actually, in the deck chair. God is not sat in the deck chair. He's not sitting there whilst we're working for him. No, he is the one who acts. God is the one who will fulfill his promises. We must trust him whilst we wait on him. And maybe if I've been speaking, you've been thinking, oh, there are some areas of my life where I'm not trusting God. I'm not trusting his promises. I am trying to grasp things for myself. Maybe you're thinking that. Well, hold on to those as we move on to our second part of our talk this morning and we will come back to them. So think of those. So first point this morning, don't try to shortcut to God's promises. It only ends in mess. Don't try to shortcut to God's promises. It only ends in mess. Second point though, is this. Trust in our radically generous God who sees us. Trust in our radically generous God who sees us. And so we rejoin the story and Hagar, finds herself in a pretty awful position. She is pregnant, she is alone, she has no husband, she has no prospects. She is in the desert, she's been terribly treated. She's on the road to Shur, which is just northeast of Egypt, so she's heading back towards Egypt, where she came from. And yet in the desert, she has an unexpected visitor. Shall we look? Here we go. So the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? The angel of the Lord comes to speak to her. She is nothing. She is an outcast. She's an outsider to Abram's family. This is what she's looked at as in the time. And yet the Lord himself, well, through his, through his angel, meets her in the desert. He calls her by name. He seeks after her. Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? He says, she, she tells the truth. But it's met with what might seem, I guess, to her like a disappointing command. The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Would she want to go back, really, to that? Would she want to go back? Surely not. Surely not. It's, a, it's been a terrible time. She has been mistreated. But God is showing Hagar the way. Stick with me, he says. Trust me. And what does he say to her? I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. That's an incredible promise to um, make to an outcast. And it's a promise that mirrors Abraham's. The promise that God makes to Abraham is an incredible promise to give to this woman. I will give you descendants more than you can count if you stick with me and my, and, um, and my people. Now, it's not the promise to Abraham. It's a different promise. God confirms Hagar's child is not the one 
through whom God will bless the whole world. What do we see? The angel of the Lord said to her, You are now pregnant, you will give birth to a son, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. You see, the the nations of the world will not be blessed through Ishmael. That is is through Isaac, that will be where we see the line all the way to Jesus. Now, that's not this line. But, in the mess of the sin, in the absolute mess Hagar finds herself in, we see this, we see that God hears. So, um, the name Ishmael, you'll have seen, means God hears. God hears and God sees. We'll see later in verse 13, um, Hagar says, Hagar actually gives God a name. This, This slave girl from Egypt gives God a name and the name is, you are the God who sees me. This is a God who sees and hears. He has known what has happened with Hagar. He's seen the hardship. He knows how she suffered and he offers incredible blessing to her. Uh, This interaction uh, between God and Hagar, it might make us think of another interaction in the desert. This time not looking back uh, earlier in Genesis, but looking forwards uh, to a story of Jesus and a Samaritan woman in the desert by a well. It's in John chapter 4. If you don't know the story, read John chapter 4. I urge you to. Um, But Jesus meets a Samaritan woman and he knows her. He knows her past. He knows her sin. He knows where she is now. He knows her current situation and he offers her also an outcast to God's people, a nobody. He offers her the greatest blessing. The greatest blessing. Know this, if God's blessing seems far off to you, if you feel lost, if you are struggling to trust God's word now, whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you've been through, God knows you. He has heard and he has seen. He is not absent whilst we wait. He is active. He comes into our mess as his son Jesus. And he cares He cares for you, but he cares for the outsider, like Hagar and the Samaritan woman. He cares for you, he cares for me, in our struggling. The God who made the stars and calls them by name knows you and knows you by name. And he says, come to Jesus. Trust Jesus. And in Jesus you will find free, certain, extravagant blessing. That will be forever. Don't try and shortcut to God's blessings, trusting on your own strength. That only ends in mess. Trust instead in our radically generous God who sees us and has acted for us. And so if you look at the Christian life, like my story at the start, like you're on a desert island and God has gone off with a promise and you're waiting for him to come back and you're sat there on your own. It's not like that. Even if you feel like you're on a desert island, God is there with you. He is the one who is acting. He is the one who is making things happen. He is the one who is keeping you going. He is the one who is fulfilling his promises. If that's how you feel this morning, that you're on a desert island and he has left, that is not true. He is there with you and he knows. So what about those areas uh, that you were struggling to trust in that we were thinking about earlier? What about those where you're doubting or grasping? Why don't we just take a couple of minutes and I'll shut up for a bit. Um, And you can just sit and have a think. How is knowing what God is like and how he is with you and how he knows you, how does that change the way you think about the ways that you're struggling? How does that help you in that? How can you turn those things over to him? So just think for a minute or two and then I will pray.
Let me pray then. Father God, creator of the stars, we praise you as the one from whom all blessings flow. We praise you as the one who can be absolutely trusted. And we thank you that you know us and that you are with us. And Lord, when we doubt, when we strive for ourselves, help us to remember that you have done it all and you do it all. Amen.